Command Sergeant Major Perlissa Wilson, and I am the Senior Enlisted Leader for the Maryland National Guard. Command Sergeant Major retired Wilson J. Thornton, and uh, my job was the State Sergeant Major, State Command Sergeant Major. They were, they were called State Command Sergeant Majors at the time, and each state and the district had one. So you were the first African-American State uh, Sergeant Major, is that correct? That's what I understand, right? But uh, I understand that it was a Sergeant Major Leonard quickly that filled in as a temp until the position was filled uh, permanently. How does it feel to, um, at that time, be the first African-American? Well, I was, I was afraid at one time, just a little leery of the position because there was a lot of responsibility from where I'd come from as a brigade sergeant, me did 58 brigade. But uh, I started uh, as a sergeant major in special forces for 19 years. And then I, was, uh, I went to the sergeant major academy and uh, then I was appointed to the 58th Brigade as a Brigade Sergeant Major, and from there down here to the uh, 5th Regiment Army. I, I joined the Guard like shortly before Sergeant Major Thornton retired, okay. so I never got to actually meet him before he actually retired. Okay. I just heard. So you, you would always hear the name Command Sergeant Major Thornton, right. Command Sergeant Major Thornton. Right. And I, I honestly, I did not even know that he was an African American Sergeant Major. I just heard Command Sergeant Major Thornton, and that was it. So um, years later, after you know meeting him, after joining the AGR force and uh, walking around here, and, and he would say, "Come here, young soldier. Who are you?" And you know, well, I well, well, so what was your rank at that time? I, I was an E five. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I was an E five because he was like, "Well, I know everybody, and I don't know you." Right. Wow. And uh, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I'm Sergeant Wilson." Um, a new AGR, I work here in the personnel services branch, and then he said, well, I'm retired Command Sergeant Major Thornton. Then I got the big bright eyes, like, wow, yeah. I am actually meeting the Sergeant Major Thornton. And I think he's been like, he's been like a great mentor and role model and, and father figure, the, all of the above, ever since I've met him. And he would always say, stay right, do the right thing, and you'll go far. Right. And I think... Um, Every milestone that I've met as an NCO, I actually honestly don't remember him not being present and in the room. Um, but he's like that for all of the NCOs that he meets and he, you know, takes under his wings. So um, while I do feel special, I know that that's just the type of leader that he is, even though he's now retired. He still feels that strongly about his role as a sergeant major and he knows that he is still viable even now and many of the soldiers now we all still listen so what made you want to still be involved in well john Freddie made that decision for me okay because if it was left up to him i would still be a state command sergeant major <laughs> uh, we just had that type of bond and relationship mm -hmm. um, um he um kept me on board. I should have retired at age 60, mm -hmm. but the Bureau let him keep me on board until age 62. Yeah. And when I retired as, uh, at uh, age 62, at my retirement, he announced to my wife that he's coming back to work Monday morning. Right. <laughs> and I was appointed as the uh, Deputy uh, Personnel Officer for the Military Department and, uh, and Special Projects Officer, doing practically the same thing I'm doing now. So when you were appointed as the senior enlisted, first female African-American senior enlisted leader. Like, what were some of the thoughts that was coming through your mind? Well, pretty much kind of the same thing that Sergeant Major said. Um, you know, there was some anxiety mm -hmm. because it was a, a huge job, it was a huge responsibility. Um, and sometimes we can be our own worst critic. Yeah. So while everyone else sees that, you know, you're ready, you may not see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was my thought. Like, wow, you know, why me? But so many people would say to me, why not you? So I had to really come to grips with that in and of itself. I don't think I actually looked at the fact that I was really going to be the first African-American and the first female. I never even really thought about that until it was said during the ceremony. It just didn't really dawn on me. It wasn't that type of mode for me. Um, but being here now in that position and in this space, I think, you know, there is a, 
a huge responsibility, mm -hmm. um, not just for me as an African American woman, but for me as an African American person, any individual right. in, in all aspects, also as a soldier, also as a female, um, because that's, that's so important, not just the aspect that I'm an African American, but I'm also a female, still within the military as a whole, um, all branches and services, females make up less than 20%. So it's a huge uh, burden in some way, shape or form because you have to make sure that you're checking all the blocks and that you're doing everything right. You know, my goal is to always operate with integrity and ethics and in respect. And so I try to make sure that I'm that at all times. I also try to make sure that I'm being an inclusive leader and that I'm in developing people like people have developed me. So um, coming up through the ranks, I didn't have a lot of female role models because there weren't a lot of female senior NCOs. Um, actually, the majority of my mentors were male. Um, some of them African-American, some of them not African-American. But I appreciate everything that everybody had, had, had um, given to me to help develop me as a leader. Um, and I do uh, honor um, Command Sergeant Major Gertrude Nobles, who mm -hmm. was the first African-American female Command Sergeant Major in the Maryland National Guard. And she was a battalion Command Sergeant Major, but she had actually was my squad leader when I was a, a, a young E2. Yeah. So I always kind of watched her and admired her. And mm -hmm. when I was getting promoted to E2 and she was making Staff Sergeant, the first sergeant asked her, what does she want to do? And she said, well, Top, I want to have your rank. By the time they got to me, because I was the last person on the line making yeah. E2, yeah. he said, well, what do you want to do, Private? I said, I want to do everything that she does, not knowing that her her path would lead her to be a command sergeant major. And and then when I even made sergeant major, I invited her back to, to pin That's me nice. because um, she definitely walked the walk of right. a senior NCO not just as a, a female, but just as a senior NCO. And I always watched her and she didn't even know I was watching. And that's how I want people to um, look at me. I wanna walk right all the time because you never know who's watching. I never knew Sergeant Major was watching me. And I would see him and, and Mr. Allen, Chief Allen, who, who worked here and he was one of our air guard and he you know passed away a few years ago. But they would be standing on a balcony and they'd be looking down and, and watching what I was doing, especially as a platoon sergeant and a first sergeant. And if I did something wrong, Sergeant Major Thornton would call me up. He was like, Top, come up and see yeah. me. And I'll come up. And then he and Mr. Allen, they would correct me and they would tell me, well, you did good, but do this the next time. Or don't say that. You know, make sure you always let the soldiers know you appreciate what they're doing. So I always remember that, you know, because you don't know who's watching. And even when you think that it's just the soldier, sometimes it's not the soldier. Sometimes it's the, the former soldier just right. there to make sure that you're doing the right thing and you're carrying the torch the right way. Nice. So I appreciated that, not just from Sergeant Major and Mr. Allen, but for all the uh, senior leaders and that we've had in organization, I try to do the same thing. A lot of times, I like to believe that um, your gift will make room for you. Um, and, you know, we, while we know we have some leaders who are born, we have some leaders who are made, and everything is timing. So, you know, if you stay the course, if you do everything that you're supposed to do, you stay positive, you stay relevant, um, make sure that you're completing your task and always stay right. I believe that it will happen for you. It may not happen when you actually want it to happen for you. Um, and sometimes it could look like there's a stumbling block in your way. But nevertheless, it'll go away eventually. And I just think that for soldiers who want to be leaders, for airmen who want to be leaders, that if they stay the course and they stay right and mm -hmm. continue to work in ethical matters, they continue to work with integrity, they continue to lead with respect, and they don't fall into habits of um, toxic leadership or uh, just doing the wrong thing and think that they'll get by. I think that the opportunities will come and it, the door will open for them soon enough and we'll find space and room for everyone. And sometimes the door doesn't open where you're looking at. Sometimes it mm -hmm. opens in another area. Mm -hmm. And so you may have to branch out and we shouldn't have that fear right. of, of going and 
another way in another direction because that opportunity is there for you and what you want is to be a leader and sometimes people look right in front of them and that's just having a small vision right as yeah. a, as opposed yeah. to having a larger vision well let me ask, <coughs> add something the key to her success and, and was to my success was leading by example mm-hmm. because the soldiers are looking at you mm-hmm. and the key is education and qualification. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Never let anybody say or turn you down for a job because you're not qualified or educated. And that was always my uh, recommendation to any soldier come in. Always education, qualification, and lead by example. The other thing about the military now is competition. You're always competing against the next soldier. So your objective is to be better than that guy. And uh, in one of my other interviews, I mentioned that uh, <clears throat> integration was great, but segregation was good too, because segregation to me was a motivation. All I had to do, and I realized that, was be better than the guys in my unit. I didn't have to compete for rank army wide. It's competitive yeah. if you want to make it. And you had, you definitely have to be the best. You have to be the best that the army got. One of the best, anyway. What, what were your thoughts, Sergeant Major Thornton, when um, Sergeant Major Wilson was appointed the first? I was there. He was there. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed it. I wouldn't have missed that one, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, what was that moment like for you? It was great. I felt good about it. Okay. I felt real good about it. Cool. Oh, yeah. Nice. And look at how she's progressed. My office was the copy room over there. They <laughs> built that office for me. Look <laughs> at she is, man. Nice. Yeah, we don't have a problem. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was really happy about yeah. that. He was there, got pictures. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and I and I think I told him. I think he was one of the first people I told when yeah. the date was set for the ceremony. I, I walked down to his office and said, the ceremony is on December the eighth. You know, you're gonna be there. He was like, I'll be there, <laughs> and, and and there he was. He was right there. I had a yeah. seat. I had a reserve seat for him yeah. and everything. So, um, that. That's just to to let you know that um, he's just been there, right? Yeah. And uh, but see, she came up through the ranks too, and that's what I was happy about. And I like the two sergeants, uh, first sergeant, and then acting sergeant major. You know. So, what do you all think um, diversity brings to the Maryland National Guard, or just any organization? Why is it important to have a diverse organization? Well, because it gives opportunities opportunities and advancement for those underprivileged uh, or those soldiers that were uh, not in the limelight. You know, uh, being a stateside uh, major or the senior enlisted uh, person uh, put you in a higher level than most of the soldiers. <coughs> and uh, they know that they can reach that level if they meet the qualifications and have the education. So if it happened to you, it could happen to them, too. That's, well, that's what they're they saying. They the qualifications. That's, 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 the, that's the feeling. That's right. the attitude. Right. right. Yeah. And, and I think what diversity does for any organization, to include the Maryland National Guard, is it, it brings a sense of what we know is the community. Right. So if um, we're right here in Maryland, and Maryland is such a diverse state, so if our National Guard doesn't look like our state, then that is a problem. We definitely have to have diversity of uh, ethnic background, um, the cultures, community, the MOSs, um, the gender. We, we have to combine all of that because the diversity of thought is very, is very important. Um, and if you have the same um, in a room and they're making a decision, then you're not making the decisions that are uh, effective for the entire organization. And then when, when, while your thought process that you made a great decision um, and it doesn't go so well with the organization, then you're like, what happened? And the organization is like, but the rest of us don't feel like that. So it's a small group. So you always, you have to make an intentional effort to maintain diversity, um, even you know, when you, you just have to make it happen. You you have to make it happen. You have to always get different people in the room. And there, there are going to be some times where you may not have it because qualifications. Yeah. But most of the time, you always have someone there. Someone is always qualified. Right. 
but we have to get out of the sense of um, wanting to be comfortable mm. with having everyone around me that looks like me or mm. talks like me or that's from the same neighborhood that I'm from. I'm in Baltimore City, you know, product of Baltimore City. I'm an urban youth. Mm. But I believe that I can speak to soldiers who were from Baltimore City. I can speak to soldiers who are from Hartford County. I can speak to soldiers who are from Southern Maryland. Mm -hmm. And we can all have a good conversation. And they can tell me some of the things that they can relate to. And I can talk to them from some of the ways that we can relate to. And then we can all put our thoughts together and just make it better for the whole organization because that's where we are.